Hi, everyone. Anyone still hungry? OK, that's better. So uh, we have a really unique opportunity. Imagine if somebody would be possible to work, for example, at ThoughtWorks, uh, maybe Google, maybe also Facebook, and then afterwards um, be a project lead for a Selenium. We actually have that guy right here. So yeah, behind you, <laughs> Simon. OK. Hi, everyone. Are we all having a great conference? Yeah, I am. I'm having a lot of fun with this. Um, thank you all for being here. I'm going to start slowly so that people can realize that the talks are starting. Um, and then we'll get on with the exciting content. Um, my name is Simon Stewart. I am the project lead for a browser automation framework called Selenium. Um, and I've been running that project now for about nine years, eight years. Um, in my professional career, uh, yes, I started at ThoughtWorks. I spent five years working at Google, where I got to see one of the largest mono repos on the planet. Um, and then I spent three years working at Facebook. And at Facebook, I was there as they transitioned from multiple separate repositories to one uh, mono repo. Um, and I led the build tool team there for the last 18 months that I was there. So we took a, had our own build tool, which I'll be covering later. And we got that to run with every single possible line of code that we had in the company. <clears throat> Are we sitting comfortably? Everyone's like a little bit like, oh, you know what? Just eating like loads of carbs and meat, and I'm a little bit tired. It'll be fine. If you feel like dozing off, just try not to snore. So um, first of all, what is a mono repo? Um, you'll notice this talk has an awful lot of kittens in it. That is so that if you're feeling tired and sleepy and it's all a little bit too much for you, there's at least something nice to look at on the screen. Um, what is a mono repo? A mono repo represents the body of code and supporting digital assets owned by an organization. Within that body of code, it's possible to draw logical boundaries around certain areas, the shared libraries, individual projects, or other groupings. So the idea here is there is one source tree for your entire organization. Not 18, not 23, not five, one. Now, in reality, no one actually has a mono repo strictly defined by this definition. Uh, even at Google, there was the main Google code base, but there's also the code base for Android, which was kept separate for legal reasons, and the code base for Chromium, uh, which was kept separate because it's enormous, vast, sprawling, complicated, and Google doesn't own all the code. So there were three main repositories at Google. Um, at Facebook, yes, we were moving towards a mono repo, but the uh, PHP code, the www code, lived in its own tree. And we had the server code, the Android code, the iOS code merged into one tree. And that process of amalgamating everything is still an ongoing process. But it's useful to actually know what it is that I'm talking about. Um, there's another assumption that I've made in this talk, which is um, that you don't have a mono repo. Does anyone have a mono repo? Does anyone have like loads of separate GitHub repositories or Git repositories? Uh, yeah, OK, that's most of the people who are, who are here have that. Um, great, uh, because if you'd all had a mono repo, this would be a really short talk. Um, so my assumption is you've got that. Um, and you'd like to understand like how microservices and your current code organization could work and why you might want to make that move to be a mono repo. And I'm going to present it to you in the same way that I presented learning how to ride a bike to my son. Um, obviously, there are several great parental lies that all grown-ups and, and adults do to their children. And one of them is, of course, I'll hold you as you're learning to ride your bike. You've got to let them go. But you don't just like fling them out and, and, and away you go. What you do is you build up slowly. So you take the first few steps. You are actually holding them. You're guiding them. And it, it's only at a certain point that they realize that you stopped five meters back, and they're now in control of their own destiny. They know what they're doing. So moving to a mono repo can be a lot like learning to ride a bike, in that you suddenly find yourself doing it accidentally. It's a lovely little cat. Um, path to microservices. Uh, I have spent a lot of time working with quite large extant code bases, code bases that are too large. 
By the way, if I speak too quickly with my strange English accent, feel free to just raise a hand and tell me that I'm speaking too fast or I'm using words you don't understand and I'll, I'll change it. Um, so yeah, you, you, I've, I've been in these code bases <laughs> that are large um, and that people have been doing it. Um, and, and generally, like, there have been several talks at this conference about like, how do you take your monolithic code base and break it into, mon into microservices. What tends to happen is everything starts off small. Like nobody sets out to write this sort of vast, sprawling pile of code that's unmanageable. Do any of you do that? Good. OK. Like no one sets out to do a bad job. <clears throat> so you start off with something small, a front end, authorization, user manager. Um, you realize that maybe logging is useful and that you need to email people occasionally. And I don't know, cake delivery is an important part of what you do. And then your app does some stuff, and it does some more stuff, and more stuff, and then it's all linked together in a real mess, um, like this. Um, interestingly, the front end only does logging. It's rubbish. Um, so you have this large application. It's a monolith. It's hard to use. Um, it's hard to break down. It's hard to like, figure out how to, how to use this thing. And so what you do is you decompose it into a set of microservices. And I've just drawn some arbitrary boundaries here. The interesting thing here is that some of these pieces are inextricably linked in some way. So Fred, when he was doing his talk the other day, talked about like, don't segment on the tables, but segment on like, the roles that those tables represent in your, in your system. Um, so yeah, so you've got these things. And the next thing that tends to happen is that people go, I want to be master of my own destiny. And they move all these into their own Git repos, or their own Mercurial repos, or I don't know, CVS or Subversion, whatever it is that makes them happy. And then, then you find yourself at peak microservices. Everyone's happy. Every time there's a new piece of functionality, you break out like a, a new repo, maybe. Um, or maybe there's um, a asking Fred about this earlier, um, communities within your organization who, who sort of have a certain amount of overlap, but not a huge amount. And so like, communities have similar related microservices in their repos. Um, and it's all quite exciting. Um, and you're at peak microservices. And this brings with it a number of advantages. One of the really nice ones, and, and I think one of the strongest motivating forces behind the development of microservices as a pattern is you get really clear functional boundaries. Like every time you leave your bit that you control, you're doing an RPC, you're aware of that. Um, and you can control everything within your tree. You probably have your own database. Like there are super clear functional boundaries. When I started working years and years ago, everyone used to integrate at the database layer. And that appears to be happening less and less. It's also now completely decoupled the release process. So a microservice being in its own repository can be released whenever you want it to be released. Right? You need to take care of um, protocol management. So if you have a data format that you're using, you need to be able to support multiple heterogeneous versions of the service that are deployed simultaneously, perhaps as you upgrade your fleet. It's unlikely that you shut down everything, upgrade one piece, and bring it all back up again. But you can decouple those releases of the individual components. You have autonomy. Uber, that well-known car company, um, they simultaneously did a talk about how they were moving to monorepos and how they were moving away from monorepos. Um, it was fascinating. But one of the arguments they had was they have more than one Git repository per engineer that they have at the company. And one of the reasons for that is they don't really like to talk to people. And if you're in your own Git repository, you don't need to talk to anyone ever. Um, so it's great for the antisocial among us. Um, and another way of saying that is that you, you have strong ownership of the code. Like if somebody needs to make a change to that code, they need to ask your permission. So you have control. You become a gatekeeper about what's coming in and what's going out of your own source control repo. Uh, repo. And that's a sort of amazingly enabling, powerful thing. And you get to manage third-party dependencies. I mean, that's a lot of fun, right? No, it's not. <laughs> it makes everyone sad. Um, you know, but you can pick the libraries you use. You can pull them in. You can update them whenever you want to do it. You have complete freedom. 
It's a wonderful thing. But these are the problems with the, micro, with the microservice world. And how can we address them? How can we limit the pain that we have? And a lot of this underlying pain isn't caused by microservices themselves. It's caused by the, by the need to have a separate repository or a small group of repositories or a large number of repositories spread through the organization. A lot of the things I'm going to cover today would happen in a large, normal repo anyway. But we need to address these issues. Um, there is a cat looking at things. So um, the first thing we need to do is actually understand what we mean by the word ownership. Like, what does it actually mean? Um, I used to work at ThoughtWorks uh, as a consultant. We like charts. If there's some way that we can draw a quadrant on a board and put ticks and boxes in it or a thing going up and to the right, we are really happy. So I'm really happy with this. Down here on the y-axis, uh, we have uh, visible and unseeable. So who can read your code? Who can go in and have a look at it? Visible code would be things like open source projects. Um, if you're in a company which allows people to read all the source code, it would be like that. Unseeable code is things like the intellectual high value property, um, a high value intellectual property, the HIP code that Google has, like the secret source that makes a search algorithm work. And if anyone could access that stuff, it would be a terrible thing. So there's some code that people hide, and it's unseeable. And then it's open. Do we welcome people coming in and doing drive-by um, uh, contributions? Like in an open source project, if it's run properly, it's both visible and open. Right? Anyone can come in. Anyone can make a change. And there's closed. You need permission of some form or another. Maybe it's a blanket denial of, like, if you're not on the team, you're not checking in. And that's a company, company which is unseeable and closed is Apple. Like, they have this sort of organization within their, their, within their company where people can't see the code of other projects. Um, Monorepos don't work in that one case. In the other cases, you can make it work. You might need to pick a source control uh, thing. Um, source control system that supports it, like Perforce, for example, for fine-grained permissions, but you can make it work. So this is what ownership is, right? This is a really important concept around microservices um, and around ownership of code and management of code. So the first thing that you need to do is to start to co-locate shared resources. So things like um, XML schema, if you're still using XML. No, no one uses XML, right? Um, the moral equivalent for JSON, your um, gRPC IDL files, things like that. There is, these are the boundaries where you form a contract with the outside world. And you want to be able to upgrade those things. So you find the places that share these interface definitions. And you start moving those, those bits of code into the same place. Um, and uh, <coughs> that gives you the ability to then make atomic updates and changes on those pieces. And it allows you to figure out whether or not you're going to break anything when you make changes to that code. Figuring out when you break something is really important. Like, we don't write code because it's fun. I mean, we do write code because it, we do write code because it's fun, right? But I mean, people pay us to do it. Why do they pay us to do it? It's because we're delivering value for the business, delivering value for the users. If we're not, if we're doing things that prevent us from being able to deliver value, then we shouldn't be doing it. And breaking the build and finding out months down the line is a really great way of destroying value and slowing your progress. So we co-locate all the shared resources. Now, um, you probably have like several projects, like the, the, the servers and the, the pieces that talk to each other are probably separate. You don't need to mash all the code into like one horrible tree. You just put them into one source control repo. So maybe you have a repo with a top-level folder per project. So all you're doing is you're moving the repositories into one place. And once you've done that, you probably have some utility code that you find super useful. Things like um, Google have Guava, the sort of shared library of code. Um, you have JSON libraries. You have libraries for doing REST. You have you know, Rails and things like that. There's this shared code that gets used throughout your company by your microservices. Like, again, Fred's comment was um, that a microservice, if it's more than 1,000 lines long, is probably too big, and that's 1,000 lines of Java. 
but you don't get to be that small without relying on third-party code in some way, or utility code. So you want to co-locate your shared code. And like I hinted, um, you then want to do centralized management of your dependencies. So for example, if you're using um, Java, what you can do, which is antithetical to the way that Java is normally done, check in your dependencies. Check in that tree. Check in your um, Maven repository. And the reason why you want to do this is the dreaded diamond dependency. Have you come across this before? No? You're a really quiet audience. Yeah, somebody's at the back going, like, I've seen it, and it's awful. So a diamond dependency is where you have project one and project two, and they both depend on library A. The problem is they depend on different versions of library A, and those two versions are incompatible. And it's an absolute nightmare to resolve those things. And it prevents you from being able to do a bunch of interesting things. As you're moving your code into a single repository, you are going to run into some of these, in, these, these conditions. So the first thing you need to do is figure out like how do you manage to do library updates. And once you've got that process in place, how do you manage library updates within the repo? Fortunately, I have here a bluffers guide to upgrading third-party dependencies. By the way, is everyone always happy when they do an upgrade of a third-party dependency? Do you just like up upgrade the version number and magically it all works without any problems? Yeah, it's a real mess, isn't it? So there needs to be some sort of structure. Why do we update third-party dependencies? Why do we update dependencies that we have in our code? First reason is neophilia. This is not a love of the main character of the Matrix. It's a love of everything that is new. Like, some developers just love the newest, shiniest, latest thing, right? They're drawn to it like a magpie to a shiny object. Neophilia is why we do, soft, uh, do uh, updates. A more pragmatic reason to do it is to get new features or bug fixes. Hey, look, someone's done something, and now like, I filed a bug, and they finally fixed it, and so I need to do an upgrade. And the next reason is the world is on fire. So um, Heartbleed was an example of the world being on fire. Suddenly, everyone needed to upgrade their versions of OpenSSL in a hurry, pronto particularly if they were sort of facing the outside world. Just this week, we've had crack, um, the, the new Wi-Fi problem with WPA2, uh, which is pretty terrifying. And all the people in the Internet of Things and, and Android and iOS and Mac OS and Windows, they all need to get an update out to somehow prevent this key, uh, this problem from happening. So there are times where you need to do a fire drill upgrade, even if you're not ready to do an update. Most of the other two, for, in most of the cases of the other two, you can just take your time. It's OK. There's no hurry. When the world is on fire, you need to move. Fortunately, updates seem to fall into sort of a bimodal distribution. I've been meaning to do that for ages. I just never got around to actually drinking some. Um, a bimodal distribution. It's either a tiny update where you have one or two users, and they're easy to find, and you can just you can find them. Or it's a massive thing that's used by everyone. So an example of a massive thing used by everyone is Boost in the C++ world, Guava in the Java world, um, some of the core libraries from .NET, um, I would imagine Simple JSON and things like that in the Ruby world. There are things that everyone uses, um, and like upgrading those is, is terrifying. When you're upgrading a small dependency, whoever it is that wants the latest update, the bug feature, the bug fix, the new feature, maybe just because they want the shiny new one, they're responsible for upgrading everyone. They go over the whole of the code base, they make the change, and they commit it. And they can make that change because now everything that uses that dependency is in your mono repo. So they can identify all the places, and they can just make the change. Like this is the Nike solution. Just do it. Don't hang around if you want to upgrade something that is on the tiny side. Things that are larger 
are more problematic. This is true. So the first thing you need to do is you need to identify the call sites of the library. <clears throat> Most uh, programming languages have a mechanism that allows you to do imports, a modular system in, in JavaScript, and the package statements, the import statements in um, Java, things like that. So you can grep for key and interesting pieces in your code base. It doesn't need to be sophisticated. You can just figure out where those call sites are. And then what you need to do is the person who wants to do the update finds individuals who are responsible for those call sites. And maybe one person owns quite a few pieces of it, and maybe they only, only own a certain piece. And you have what I like to call a conversation. Now, a conversation is where you talk to someone, and you say, it's really important that we do this. Could you help me, please? And when someone asks something like that, the polite thing to do is to go, yeah, I'll do what I can to help you. That would be great particularly when it comes to updating third-party dependencies. Have that conversation. Ask someone to help. They'll do it. Like, I upgraded um, a version of, of um, a JavaScript library written in Java, um, Rhino, at, at Google. And it was used all over the place. It was a nightmare. Um, and the conversation with the teams was normally quite tricky. It was like, I need to update your version of Rhino, um, and I need some help. Could someone on your team like, help me make sure that I don't break anything, that it's all good? And people go, I'm really, really busy. And it's like, I oh, know, but I really need a hand. And there's always someone on the team who goes, like, I haven't got much time, but send me a patch, or I'll show you how to do it, and, and then we'll, we'll do it. And so all that work was being done um, on a branch. Did a branch. Every time uh, someone sent me a, uh, a change request, I landed it on that branch. Um, and at least once a day, I was syncing that branch to, mar uh, branch to master. If you've ever done trunk-based development, that is basically what you do. You do a feature on a branch, and you, you merge um, into master, so that the last thing you do is you just put it into trunk. And that's exactly what you do. So it seems like a complicated process. But actually, it's just a stepwise process. You identify each of the call sites, do the upgrades. Now, the, the nasty thing is, the first few times you do this, particularly as you're merging repositories together, it's painful. Like, there's no getting away from it. Like, very few people check in a library, a third-party dependency, and then track that dependency over time. Most of the time, they go, my code is compiling, my tests are passing, it's working in production, I'm leaving it alone. So yeah, you're going to have like version skew all over the place. But it's possible to do it. But there are difficulties when you're upgrading these things. I was tempted to let that one loop, but I just thought I'd leave it. Um, there are difficulties. The first of these is a very natural fear of change. You want me to update this library? I have no idea whether this will work. Like, what? That's a rubbish excuse. Like, if you're worried about change in your code base because of a third-party library changing, you're worried about change in your code base. And that suggests you probably haven't got a rigorous testing regime in place, or in fact, any testing regime in place. You should be able to just speculatively do an update and go like, oh, OK, this breaks things, or, oh, this appears to work, and our tests will pass. Right? That's the thing that gives you the confidence to be able to do an update. Another reason is that sometimes APIs change rad radically. Um, IBM's ICU, their Unicode library, is notorious for breaking API compatibility with every release. It's a real pain in the backside. And sometimes you just need to live with multiple versions of things in your code base and assume it'll be fine. Um, but ideally, yeah, it'll be all right. Um, and sometimes. The reason why APIs have changed radically is you've just skipped too many versions. For a long time at Facebook, we were stuck on Guava 10. And what we wanted to do was go on to the latest version, which was like, I don't know, 18 or 19 at the time. We'd missed seven or eight releases. And when you did the jump from 10 to 18, everything broke. And there were so many broken things, and it was so complicated. It was just this daunting, terrible task. How did we resolve the problem? Well, we didn't jump from 10 to 18 in one go. Like, first rule of programming, if you've got a problem, change one variable at a time to try and figure out what that problem is. So rather than going from version 10 to 18, 
Go for version 10 to 11. There'll be a few things that, that need to be fixed. You'll fix them. Now, the nice thing is, once you've done this incremental one-step update, what you've managed to do is improve the state and health of your code base. Right? So even if you stopped there, you would have made the, life be you you would have made the project better, the, the code base better. You'd have been following the Boy Scout rule. You know, the campsite rule? Like, when you arrive, leave the campsite in the same condition or better than, than uh, when you leave it. What on earth was that? If I do that again, does it happen? No. Um, so yeah, the, um, uh, follow, the, follow that rule. Do slow incremental updates. You can do it. Now, ownership. People love to defend their code. It's their code. Like, um, is it though? Like at Facebook, anyone could go to any piece of code and make any changes. And the only requirement they had was that somebody do a code review and they could, they could do whatever they wanted. And at one point, I had two interns who were reviewing each other's code. And they were checking in the sort of metastasizing ball of horror into the code base. Because they go like, yep, that looks like Java. So it's meant to be PHP. Ah, oh, never mind, just check it in anyway. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are some places that are completely open and it's cool, but most places like to maintain some level of ownership. And that level of ownership really comes down to how you've organized your source code repositories. If you have multiple different source code repositories that are cloned and people can pick which, it, which, which one they want to call the master, you never had code ownership. Like if someone can take your repo, fork it, and depend on that, and that's the thing they use, you don't have code ownership. It's an illusion. Give up on that illusion. You'll be happier. Like giving up on your illusions generally is a good piece of life advice. Do you have a single Git repo, or Mercurial repo, or Subversion repo, or Perforce repo? That's fantastic. All of these systems allow you to have um, a pre- or post-commit hook. And that might be something really, um, really lightweight, like sending an email when uh, code has changed and part of the tree you're concerned about. If you use a tool like Fabricator for code review, that actually has heralds where you can do this. But it's easy enough to implement that stuff. If you're doing code review, even better, right? Gerrit, Fabricator, tools like that allow you to enforce code ownership in the code review tool. Like they won't let you check code in unless somebody who owns a component, and ownership is defined as like being in a file somewhere saying you're an owner, um, has, has reviewed and okayed it. And a more extreme version of that is GitHub's code owners feature. How many of you use GitHub as your main source control? Okay, that's about a third of you. Um, they have this new feature, code owners, and you can just put in a file with patterns following like the, the Git um, expression, and you can say these people, these teams, are responsible for this part of the code, and you can lock it down so that only people who have permission can make the edits. That's great. Now, while we've been busy upgrading libraries, co-locating dependencies, co-locating shared resources, co-locating our our library code, we've accidentally found ourselves building a mono repo. We didn't mean to. That wasn't what we set out to do. It was what we set out to do. But it was like a, just a sort of slow, incremental process. It wasn't a big bang. It wasn't like you, you leave work on Friday with 18 different repos. You come in, there's one. This has happened over the course of months. Like We didn't rush into it at, 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 at Facebook. Um, and Google's grew organically. So we end up with a sort of interesting question, like, how do you structure a monorepo? Like, the original idea was top-level directory for each repository, and, and that is a really good bootstrapping process. But there are other ways of organizing it. Maybe you do it language-based. Like, most projects, even today, only use one language. It's either Java, or it's C Sharp, or it's Ruby, or it's Python, or it's JavaScript. So you could segment on the language level, right, and just put the projects underneath there. You could segment the code base by functional area. Hey, logging utilities are here. Testing utilities are here. Um, I don't know. Uh, project one is here. Project two is here. Um, that's great. The best way to kill a functional area breakdown of your monorepo is to use project code names as directories. You may think that project Loki is obvious, but I guarantee you it's not. 
And one of the advantages of a mono repo is you can go and find code. Like the best line of code to write is somebody else's because they have to maintain it for you. So you want to be able to find code easily, which is why you want to do um, perhaps a functional distribution. Or maybe you do it project based. You know, just put all the projects up at the top, top level. My favorite is a blended approach. So uh, the Google code base is segmented with languages at the top level. And within, within those language directories, they've segmented it by functional area, so using the mechanisms that are popular within the language. So for Java, that's using the, the package namespaces. Um, and for C, C++, Python, um, they've broken it up into well-named functional areas like networking, I.O., things like that. So you could do that. Facebook did something similar. Um, it broke it up into um, shared code that was used across Android, iOS, um, and the server side. And then it had like Android code here, iOS code here, server-side code here. Um, and slowly, things were being migrated into that common directory. So again, it wasn't all done in one massive jump. It's done slowly. So you need to think and put some serious thought into how you structure your monorepo. If you get this wrong, you will have a miserable time. So do the initial migration and then do another one where you actually sit down and design things. I know, I know. Bit of forethought. And you've got all the code of your company and all the digital assets in one place. You have a fat repo, a fat repository. Um, one way of dealing with this is to not deal with it. This laptop I have here has a 256 gig hard drive. The history of all of the Selenium code could fit on there multiple, multiple times, even with all the binary dependencies. Disk space is dirt cheap. I mean, that's not a very helpful thing to say. So a more helpful thing to say, a constructive piece of advice, is to make use of shallow, sparse clones. So normally when you're using Git or Mercurial or a DVCS, you download the entire history of the project. A shallow clone just gets the most recent revision. You can do minus minus depth in Git, um, and you can say how far back in history you want to go. Only get the latest version. That would be nice. A sparse clone is slightly different. A sparse clone is where you only check out particular subdirectories of the entire repo. So rather than checking out everything, just check out the bits that you need. Or like one of the complaints about mono repos is I need special tooling. Everyone else is writing that tooling for you. Microsoft have uh, approximately 300 gigabytes of source, con source code, um, and they use Git in one repo. They have a 300 gig single repo, a mono repo. And they have a, a, a thing called the Git to Virtual File System, GVFS. Um, and that allows them to, to scale it out, like the clone operations, the um, uh, checking out code, doing builds, super fast because they've got GVFS. And one of the things that helps with this is tools like Watchman, which is a file system watching daemon. It keeps an eye on the file system. And it goes like, hey, look, I've noticed things have changed. Um, and so operations, file operations, scale linearly with the number of files that have been changed rather than the number of files in your, in your repository. So you can make things that are incredibly slow and tedious incredibly far, uh, fast. So minimal clones, um, two ways of doing it. You can just put the project definitions into source control and download them and then initialize your tool. Um, or you can make use of a thing known as a graph-based build tool to determine a minimal working set. Graph-based build tool is a terrible name um, because all build tools are effectively working on a graph, right? A directed acyclic graph of things they need to do, going all the way back to make. Like make, you can run it in parallel because it does like an analysis, builds a DAG, and then goes like, oh, these steps can be run in parallel safely. I'll do that. Graph-based build tool in this particular context is one that is designed to work particularly well with a mono repo. They encourage you to check in build files on a per package, per directory basis. Um, so the granularity is super fine. And they tend to be functional in nature. So for the same input, they always give the same output, um, which is a really nice property. If you take the same input files, you get the same output. And that means that you can use distributed caches, both Buck and Bazel, um, Buck by Facebook, Bazel by, by Google. Um, support the use of a distributed cache. That can slash your build times. Like, ah, oh, I've got to build everything. 
Like it, even on a small project, a distributed cache can make things incredibly fast. And they also allow you to query the build graph. So you can go like, what do I need in order to build this target? And you can get the list of all the directories, all the files that you need to check out and clone. And that's a really useful thing to do. So if you're interested in Buck, it's available at Buck Build. Bazel is bazel.build. They are both excellent tools. But here's the nice thing. You don't need to use them with a mono repo. All they do is they make things more efficient. So kind of let's, let's revise, take a look at what we've done. Do I need to change my tooling? I use Yarn, I use Maven, I use Gradle, I use whatever it is. Do I need to change my tooling in order to move to mono repo? And the answer is no. You can just keep on doing exactly what you're doing now. Just move all your code into one place. Do you need a fancy source control system? No. Do I need a fancy build tool? No. Do I need a fancy continuous integration server? No. You just need to put all your code and digital assets in one place. Ah, but I hear you say. What about continuous integration? We all do continuous integration, right? We all know what it is. Do I need to define it for anyone? OK, great. Um, so we all do continuous integration. One of the complaints is like, ah, mono repo means now I'm going to really stress out the source control server, and my build slaves are going to be exhausted, and it's going to be terrible. You know what? That is true if you just do things in a blind and stupid way. You can make it work that way. Like uh, if you're on a fast internal network, you've got gigabit networking. Even cloning a large repo doesn't actually take that long. It doesn't put the, the central server under that much stress. But um, you can make changes to that first stage. So you can use tools like Buck and Bazel if you're using them to query the build graph and just build the minimal set of things that need to be built. Or you can do um, a sparse clone of just the things that need to be checked out. And then you can build that. It need not be any heavier than what you're doing at the moment. Ah, ah, here you say. But release cadence. You'll notice I'm not going to mention anything about like talking to people. I just assume you're adults and you're going to talk to people. Um, but what about release cadence? My code is in the same place as the other services that I, that I need to release. Um, so obviously, I need to release at the same time which is an absolutely ludicrous thing to say. Like, you live with your family or your friends or your housemates in the same house, right? Do you all have to leave the house at the same time and come back to the house at the same time? No. Why would it be the same with your source code? How you organize your source does not dictate when you release software. So every module can have its own release cadence, its own way of doing that. Um, I said I wasn't going to mention autonomy. I haven't got a slide in here. But it's actually quite useful to know that lots of the build tools out there, as well as um, being able to enforce ownership at the code level using source control, you can also use your build tool to enforce um, these things. Both Buck and Bazel support visibility on rules. So in summary, hey, look, monorepos, heart microservices. I've used Imagery four times in this presentation. I obviously like them. Um, they love microservices, right? And it's going to make your life easier, because you'll be able to do things like make atomic commits across the entire code base. You'll be able to figure out which versions of a library need to be updated. If you make a change somewhere, you'll be able to identify what that impacts. It's great. I mean, you do need to talk to people, but uh, you win some, you lose some. You can maintain your current level of ownership without needing to give it up. If you have a repo and you never let anyone check into that, the source control, the build tool can enforce that for you. So you end up with a, um, you already had a social convention. And now all you're doing is you're making that social convention, you're reifying it and depending upon it. Once you've got all your code in one place, you can get greater build efficiencies with a graph based build tool. Like when we doubled the size of the Android code base at Facebook, the build times remained exactly the same. When we introduced Buck to our C++ code, there was one project that was taking in the, in the order of three to four hours to compile. And when we left, it was taking 12 minutes. Like You can get huge amounts of efficiency gains by using um, a graph-based build tool. And you can do efficiency gains with checking out projects. So you don't need to maintain um, 
project definition files for sparse checkouts or anything like that. And you can also use visibility rules to enforce the boundaries um, within your project and maintain ownership. So the next slide says, any questions? I'll go back to this one, because I think it's quite handy to have the, have, the, have the summary there. But are there any questions that I could help you with with a sort of whirlwind tour of monorepos, microservices, dependency management? Actually, we have questions from audience, so I will just read uh, sure. the first one. How do you operationally manage a monorepo in a large scale, say hundreds or thousands of repos, uh, examples for like build time, fetching time, et cetera? Um, you don't have hundreds and thousands of repos. You have one. Um, let's do some analysis, right? Let's just throw some rough numbers out there. Um, the Selenium, let's, in fact, here we go. See whether I can get my machine to work. Let's, uh, let's mirror the displays. Da, 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 da. Mirror, built-in retina display, thank you. All right. Terminal. CD, source, Selenium, trunk. Increase the font size. Can you see that at the back? OK, so this is my working copy of Selenium. It's 13 years old. Um, if you take a look. It's got pieces in here for Java, JavaScript, .NET, Python, Ruby, everything. If you take a look in the third-party directories, um, we have actually checked in all the dependencies for JavaScript and for Python and for Ruby and for Java, like, and we've been maintaining these binary things. So this is an old code base, and I happen to have the complete history. So I'm just going to measure the, the usage. That's about 3 gig for 13 years of code. If you're on a network with a gigabit per second connection, which actually is pretty common these days, cloning that three gig is going to take a couple of minutes. Like, it's not going to be too bad. Um, your code base is probably larger than Selenium's. But it's also undoubtedly true that it's going to be smaller than, than, than Google's. It's going to be smaller than um, Facebook's. And even a clone of the, Google, of the Facebook repo wasn't particularly bad. Um, one of the things that GitHub allows you to do is download a tarball of the tree at a certain point. So you might be able to bootstrap off the back of that, which is how Mozilla, who have, operate a, a central repo, have. They have snapshots, which you download. You unpack it onto disk, and then you just do a pull. And rather than having to get the full history from you know, year dot, you just get the, the delta between the thing you downloaded and what you have. So um, the, the cloning doesn't actually take that long. And modern servers, like this beastie here, is a laptop. In fact, this phone here is more powerful than the machine that I used to use for work five years ago. Right? This is just a mobile phone. Like CPU is cheap um, and plentiful. And yes, you do stress things out, particularly if everyone in the company simultaneously clones. And there will be you know, moments where that happens. But generally speaking, the load is fairly even. So you don't stress out any of the individual components too badly. The only time you might. So if you have a fan out continuous build, and each stage um, checks out everything. So you might need to modify that. I don't, know. I don't know who asked that question, but I hope it answers it. Yeah, it was from audience. So um, one other one was, uh, what are disadvantages of monorepos? Disadvantages of monorepos. Um, <sighs> kind of big. Like, there's no getting away from the fact that, like, here's the thing. In your head, just as an exercise, right, imagine a sunrise, right? Just imagine a beautiful sunrise, and then think of five words to describe that sunrise. Five words. OK? You done it? Turn to the person sitting next to you. Tell them your, your five words. Listen to their five words. Raise your hand if those five words are identical. So you know, just do it. Five seconds, 10 seconds. I am seeing no re I'm seeing people laughing, like I have to talk to people. Um, <laughs> nobody has, has used the same five words to describe something. Like software development is collaborative art. We are taking like 
an image that somebody has, like the image of a sunset or the image of how customer processing should be work. And we're taking that raw thought stuff and we're turning it into something concrete. And we're doing that together because no one individual can write all the code that needs to be written. Like software is collaborative. You will need to talk to people. People hide behind separate repositories and some of the design patterns to avoid talking to people. So the downside is if you're a little bit, like I have low social energy. Like, this is great, and then I'm going to go home and sleep for a week because, like, I've exhausted myself. Um, like, but it's hard work. Like, software development is people, and a mono repo means you can't hide from that. The other thing as well is you need a relatively high level of discipline. Around, like, coding should be a high discipline activity anyway. Like, if you're doing TDD properly, that is high discipline coding. Um, but managing those third-party dependencies and doing the politics of, like, hey, look, I really need to get this update in. Can you help me? is tricky. So you, you can't run away from that. But these are problems that you would probably have to face anyway at some time. Um, so you're amortizing the cost of, of these things in a mono repo, but by amortizing it, you make it more visible and you make it more painful. Sorry, guys and gals. Yeah, I think we, we run over time. So Simon, will I be able to ask, uh, you will I be able to ask Simon afterwards for any questions? And thank you, Simon. Thank you good. all very much.